This conference will now be recorded. Good morning, student. In the last last session, we discussed regarding the the lesions of the prostate and testes, and of course the penis. The almost uh, the entire male genital system was discussed in the last class. So today, what I'm going to discuss is uh, today the lesions of the lower urinary tract, like uh, the bladder, the urethra, uh, and <clears throat> And of course, a few important sexually transmitted diseases you need to know because there are many good number of MCQs uh, I mean, you come across in syphilis. So actually, one of the another very common disease in, in 90s before the discovery of penicillin. So, so we, we the, now we are not getting much complications of syphilis because because everybody so whoever comes to our OP or whoever comes to the hospital, so we immediately we prescribe a third generation caplosporin or fourth generation caplosporin or at least the basic second generation caplosporin, not even the basic benzyl penicillin. Okay, so because of that, what the, the, we are not uh, getting the lesions of I mean syphilitic lesions nowadays, but. But as a student, as a basic uh, MBBS student, I have to know there are many important MCQs in syphilis. That's why I want to cover syphilis in detail in this class regarding the topic of sexually transmitted diseases. So before we are going to the topic of STDs, <clears throat> so I'm going to discuss about the, the lesions of the urinary blood. Hope everybody is following. So please join us, those who are not joined uh, in this, uh, for the session. <clears throat> So let us discuss the, the non-neoplastic conditions of the bladder. So which include, this is a, a, a bladder or vesicle diverticulum. It's a simple thing. It's like a pouch. So which is coming out of the, uh, coming from the bladder wall. So you especially at the, the, the dome of the bladder. Okay. So this is very common. This is very benign condition. Nothing to worry. So what is the problem with this is, uh, so sometimes what happens is there will be urinary stasis in that dome and lead to infection. So lead to cystitis this is a problem otherwise most of the conditions so it is it is not uh, a big problem to the patient <clears throat> so one more important uh, uh, mcq we have to remember in this slide is so hemorrhagic cystitis so hemorrhagic cystitis is due to intake of either the drug cyclophosphamide or because of the adenovirus infection so these are the two important mcqs you have to remember in this slide we hope everybody is following. So this 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 hemorrhagic cystitis won't leave you. At some point of time, they will they will. I mean, it may come as a question in your MD or MS entrance. So please remember, hemorrhagic cystitis is due to either because of the intake of so cytotoxic antidermal drug cyclophosphamide or because of the adenovirus infection. Next is a <clears throat> next condition is interstitial cystitis, otherwise called as chronic pelvic pain syndrome. So, in, so actually, a few of the actually um, women will complain this type of chronic pelvic pain syndrome. So this is because of the so chronic cystitis occurring mostly in women is characterized by persistent painful uh, form of chronic cystitis occurring most most frequently in women. It is characterized by intermittent, often severe suprapubic pain. So with increased urinary frequency, urgency, hematuria, dysuria, and if you do a culture, you will not find any bacterial growth. So that's why this is called as interstitial cystic or it's called chronic pelvic pain syndrome. Okay, so if you, if you do a cystoscopy and see, if you, what you see is a fissures and punctate hemorrhages within the bladder mucosa, which is otherwise called as glomerulations. Or it's called as glomerulations. This one is a very diagnostic feature of interstitial cystitis. So this is a, the this is a glomerulation finding is an endoscopic cystoscopic finding. So sometimes, sometimes what uh, you can do is you can take a biopsy because suppose if there is suspicion of any any infection or any any growth you suspect, what you do is you take a biopsy. So what so what what you will get in biopsy there is a so, uh, there is a fibrosis in the wall of the bladder, so, and which results in ultimate results in contracted bladder later on. I mean, in in due course of time. Okay, this is that's all about this interstitial cystitis, otherwise called chronic pelvic pain syndrome. Okay, 
So one one important point you have to remember in this uh, interstitial hysteresis is uh, one is glomerulations, which is a cystoscopic finding. Other one is the contract transmural fibrosis and and histology. Next is malacoplakia. This is again very 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 important. It may come. It may come as a two mask question. Malacoplakia. So most commonly occurs in the bladder and results from defects in phagocytic or degradative function of macrophages is that phagosomes become overloaded with undigested bacterial products. Okay. <clears throat> it is actually, so not with the problem within the bladder, but it is with the problem with the, the, the phagocytosis. There is a defect in the phagocytic or degradative function of macrophages such that phagosomes become overloaded with undigested bacterial products. So the macrophages have abundant granular cytoplasm filled with phagosomes stuffed with particulate and membranous bacterial debris. Okay. So what is important in this uh, slide is the Michael is Gertman bodies. Okay. These are nothing but the laminated mineralized concretions resulting from deposition of calcium in enlarged lysosomes. So they are typical presence within the macrophages. This point is very, very, very important point. You have to note it down. The presence of this Michael is Gutman bodies, which is very, very diagnostic of malacoplakia. And this Michael is Gutman bodies will can be demonstrated by using a, a special stain called Vancosa, which is a calcium stain. Okay. So, or alizarin. This is the, both are used for demonstration of calcium. So, because uh, this Michael is Gutman contains the Gutman bodies contain these laminated mineralized concretions. So, by using those two special stains, so we can so detect this uh, uh, the condition diagnose this condition of malacoplakia. So very 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 important. So sometimes it we may get as too much question or definitely may be asked in the MCQs. Next, just like polypoid cervicitis, we have a condition called polypoid cystitis. So it's an inflammatory condition resulting from irritation to the bladder mucosa in which urothelium is thrown into broad bulbous polypoid productions as a result of marked submucosal edema okay so so what, what clinically and of course the histologically so what how it mimics is it mimics like a papular urethral carcinoma so that's why before you make a diagnosis of papular urethral carcinoma you should make sure that the, whether the nuclear polymorphism and atp and of course the increased mitotic activity is there or not so uh, the differential diagnosis for papular urethral carcinoma is a polypoid cystitis so among this, all these benign conditions, what is very important for you is the malacoplakia. So malacoplakia may come as either two mask question or the Michael is Gettman bodies may be asked as an MCQ. Please remember that. And sometimes you may be asked question of what is the special time used for demonstrating Michael is Gettman. That answer you should remember that is Vonkosa. Vonkosa. V-O-N. V-O-N. K-O-S-S-E. Kosa. Vonkosa state. Okay, next one, the metaplastic lesions of the bladder. So they are very interesting. Actually, if you become a pathologist, if you want to become a pathologist, so, or if you, or you want to study I mean, MD pathology, you will find a lot of these conditions like Brunner's, cystitis ganglia, cystitis cystica, all these things. So the very interesting points. You all know that the urinary bladder is lined by urothelium. You all know that. Everybody has know, you know that urinary bladder is lined by Transistional epithelium, otherwise called as urothelium. Okay, what happens is sometimes this transistional epithelium or urothelium will, I mean, will project into the lamina proper in the form of a small less. Okay. So you all know that the urinary bladder will have a four layers, like mucosal layer, submucosal layer, muscular proper layer, and serosal layer. Okay. So that the, the you know the surface epithelium is urothelium. So it is, it is in the form of sheets, but sometimes what happens is this urothelium will project into the lamina proper in the form of a smallness, which is called as brunness. So again, in due course of time, what happens is the central portion of the this nuss will become, will be cystic and it will be lined by either the cuboidal or columnar epithelium. So then, so if there is a columnar epithelium, if you are seeing in a bladder, then it is called as a cystitis glandularis. Is called as cystitis granularis. Sometimes that cyst space will be filled with a clear fluid. Then we call it as a cystitis cystica. It is called as a cystitis cystica. 
sometimes you will find goblet cells within that the cuboidal or columnar epithelium which mimics like intestine then we call it as intestinal or colonic metaplasia or rarely so what happens is there is a transformation into a squamous epithelium which is called as squamous metaplasia okay so usually found in the trigon of the woman okay but sometimes you know so uh, i mean uh, the remnants of urecus remnants of urecus also will be lined by the squamous epithelium and the squamous cell cars of urinary bladder do occur at the remnants of the urecus that we will discuss in the next slides next is the neoplasms of the blood so majority of the bladder cancers are urothelial car carcinomas and uh, you see this you see the figure 90 percent the 90 percent of the bladder cancers are the urothelial carcinomas there are squamous cell carcinomas represent about three to seven percent and it's more common in countries where urinary chistogeomias is, is endemic okay so don't think that it is it is, uh, it is uncommon in uh, i mean like it is very common in egypt so the this chistogeoma is very endemic in egypt but 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 even in india we we have seen cases of urinary chistogeomias i personally reported one case of urinary chistogeomias okay don't think it is uh, it is it is not common in, in our country it is also seen in our country i personally reported the case of urinary chestogenesis okay so what happens is if there are if the parasites are there within the bladder what it will do is it will what it will what it will irritate so once there is a irritation there will be inflammation once there is an inflammation there will be dna repair so what happens is so because of the irritation dna repair and what happens some point of time the, the the dna repair mechanism won't take properly it results in mutation and results in carcinoma so this is uh, what is the, the pathogenesis for so the carcinoma occurring in a patients with urinary cystogenesis okay sometimes adenocarcinomas are are, are 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 rare actually they arise from rachial remnants in the dome of the bladder or in association with extensive intestine sorry i told regarding squamous cell carcinoma but not that not that's not correct what is what is actually the from urethral remnants what you get is adenocarcinoma so squamous cell carcinoma is in association with the urinary cystogenesis i uh, i want to correct myself okay so adenocarcinoma arises from the urethral remnants in the dome of the blood next pathogenesis the most common factors for is the cigarette smoking various occupational carcinogens uh, especially paints paint workers and those who are working in chimneys in industries and infection with cystogenesis hematoma is already we discussed so tumor is initiated by the deletion of tumor suppressor genes on the chromosomes 9 on the short term and long term of chromosome 9 leading to the formation of superficial papilla tumors and few of them acquire 50 53 mutations and progress to invasion so <clears throat> so what happens sometimes it, it may the tumor may be initiated like this there will be mutation in the tp53 tp53 gene then later there will be formation of carcinoma in situ then there will be loss of chromosome 9 and progresses to invasion this is the second line of initiation or so there will be mutation of the fibroblast growth factor receptor 3 resulting in superficial tumors then there will be activation of the ras pathway involving ras oncogene then there will be loss of function mutation in 153 and retinoblastoma so these are the three ways the tumor is initiated okay one is because of the deletion of the tumor suppressor genes on the short and long term of chromosome 9. Later on, the mutation on the P53, then invasion, or mutation on P53, then carcinoma in situ, then and uh, loss of chromosome 9 and progress invasion, or mutation in the fibroblast growth factor receptor 3, then crash, then P53. So these are the different. So each will help each other, then it will ultimately. It will progress into invasive bladder carcinoma. So, so these are the different types of mutations you have to remember in bladder carcinoma. This is a photograph I'm, uh, I'm projecting. You can see the, you can see the from the bladder mucosa. You, you can see a, a finger-like papillary projections projected into the lumen of the urinary bladder, which is called as, as a papillary tumor. Okay, this is so it's not invading. That's why it's called it's a non-invasive papillary tumor. And most common is this non-invasive papillary tumors are, are are most 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 common. Later, what happens is the tumor will invade into the the muscularis proper. Then we call it as invasive papillary carcinoma. Or sometimes, so because of the mutation of p53, initially there will be 
the disease in the, the lining mucosa, which is called as carcinoma in situ, then it will invade. Then it's called as a flat invasive carcinoma. So the tumor can arise in, I mean, can come in different ways. So you have to, like, you should diagnose based on PAPs. This non-invasive papillary urethral neoplasms are grazed based on graded based, graded based on atopia to reflect their biological behavior. So one of them is the papilloma. Okay, this is just simple papilloma. Second one is a papillary urethral neoplasm of low malignant potential. That is a low grade papillary urethral carcinoma and a high grade papillary urethral carcinoma. So these are the different types of the papillary urethral neoplasms. These exophytic papillary neoplasms are to be distinguished from inverted urethral papilloma, which is entirely benign and not, not associated with an increased risk for subsequent carcinoma. So this is how it looks. You can see uh, it is a case of a non-invasive low-grade papillary urethral carcinoma. So in a high power, you can see a, a irregular nuclei with scattered mitotic. You can see a mitotic figures. Okay. So if, if you see there is a nuclear ATP, definitely there is a nuclear pleomorphism. And so this is how it looks a non-invasive low-grade papillary urethral carcinoma. Let us see the different, I mean, the prognosis of regarding this non-invasive papillary urethral neoplasms. Suppose if it is a papillary mother, recurrence is rare and invasion is, there will be, there won't be any invasion and progression is also rare and death is also rare. I mean, uh, I mean, it won't occur. And papillary urethral neoplasm of low malignant potential, the recurrence is around 30%. Uh, invasion is again none. Progression is only 2% and death is none. In low-grade urethral carcinoma, the recurrence is around 45%. Invasion is less than 10 percent, and progression is 8 to 10 percent, and death is around 2 to 3 percent. Whereas in high-grade urethral carcinoma, the recurrence is around 45 percent, invasion is up to 80 percent, progression is 30 percent, and death is around 20 percent. So this is how it looks a, a case of carcinoma in situ. You can see the the lot of nuclear ATP and occasional mitotic figures are seen within. And if, if you see, there is a loss of polarity, loss of nuclear polarity. The nucleus is situated at the tip of the, the cell rather than at the base of the cell. This is called as loss of nuclear polarity. Next is invasive urethral cancer. It is associated with papillary urethral cancer, usually of high grade. Or carcinoma in situ may superficially invade a lamina propria or action more deeply into the underlying muscle. And so here, the problem is that the, the pathologists, there is, if the, so most of them, they underestimate the extent of invasion by abscess presence, so which is a significant problem. The extent of invasion and spread at the time of initial leg is the most important prognostic factor. Almost all infiltrating urethral carcinoma are of high grade. Blood tumors most commonly present with painless hematuria. Risk of recurrence is related to several factors, including tumor size, stage, grade, multifocality, myotic index, and associated dysplasia and carcinoma in situ in the surrounding mucosa. So whereas high grade papillary urethral carcinoma frequently are associated with either concurrent or subsequent invasive urethral carcinoma, lower grade papillary urethral carcinoma often recur but infrequently invade. Okay. So, so but the high grade lesions will invade whereas the low grade will recur but they infrequently recur. This is what you have to remember. We are coming to the treatment for bladder cancer. It depends on tumor grade and stage on whether the lesion is flat or papillary. For small localized papillary tumors that are not high grade, the initial transurethral resection is both diagnostic and therapeutically sufficient. Whereas patients with tumor that are at high risk for recurrence or progression typically receive topical immunotherapy consisting of intravisical installation of BCC, that is basal leg almatic urine, and which elicits a typical granulomatous reaction and in and in doing so, also it gives an effective local anti-tumor immune response. So this is how, how it works, uh, the BCG. So BCG, you all know that it is given interdermally in a, in a neonates, okay? So for, for the for protection against uh, tuberculous meningitis and of course, uh, um, disseminated tuberculous infection. So, but the, the same BCC is used in bladder cancer to, to bring the uh, effective local anti-tumor immune response. This is what you have to remember regarding the treatment for bladder cancer, which is a very, very, very important MCQ.
for so for patients who are closely monitored for tumor recurrence with periodic cystoscopy and and urine cytology studies for the rest of their lives so radical cystectomy is reserved for tumor invading the muscularis propria carcinoma in situ or high grade papular cancer refractory to bcg or carcinoma in situ extending into the prostatic urethra and down the prostatic ducts where bcg cannot contact the neoplastics and advanced bladder cancer treated with chemotherapy which can be palliative but not curative this is how the treatment for bladder cancer is planned okay so suppose the tumor invades the muscular propria then radical cystectomy is a treatment of choice and this you have to remember so this is that's all about the urinary bladder now we are moving on to, uh, going on to the subject of sexually transmitted diseases okay <clears throat> let us see the list of uh, the sexually transmitted diseases so we have uh, the the list of organisms both viruses bacteria protozoa so which can cause the sexually transmitted diseases so let us see the viruses first the herpes simplex virus so it causes primary and recurrent herpes and neonatal herpes hepatitis b virus will cause hepatitis human papilloma virus will cause condylema acuminatum okay and the carcinoma carcinoma of the penis and of course the condylema acuminatum and in females it causes cervical dysplasia and cancer and vulvar cancer whereas in hiv human immunodeficiency will cause you know that acquired immunodeficiency syndrome so these are the different viruses which are transmitted by by sexual route next is the infection with chlamydia chlamydia trachomatis which causes urethritis epididymitis proctitis so it causes lymphoglanduloma venerum in females it causes urethral syndrome cervicitis parthenitis salpingitis and of course the, the complications of it whereas the mycoplasma will cause urethritis cervicitis whereas bacteria will cause Neisseria will cause epididymitis, prostatitis infrastructure, urethritis, proctitis, pharyngitis, disseminated gonococcal infection. Service in females it causes cervicitis, endometritis, varicitis, serpingitis, and of course the sequela of it like infertility, ectopic pregnancy, and recurrent salpingitis. Whereas Treponema pallidum will cause syphilis, Haemophilus decrease will cause chancroid, Calimetabacterium gram will cause granulum inguinal, which are called donovanesis. Shigella and Campylum bacteria will cause infocolitis, which also can be transmitted by sexual route. Whereas <laughs> Trichomonas vaginalis will cause urethritis, vulnitis, in females it causes vaginitis. Antomy pestilitic will cause amoebiasis and GI glamour will cause GIDs. Okay. So this is a list of uh, the sexually transmitted diseases is given in the Robbins test book. So I'm not going to, I mean, uh, 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 all the, the details because it will be discussed in the microbiology. Each, each bacteria, each virus will be discussed in detail in microbiology. What is important? Okay. And one more important point I want to tell is there are five sexually transmitted diseases that require that CDC notification. CDC nothing but Centers for Disease control on research okay so <clears throat> these are the five sexually transmitted diseases you have to notify one is chlamydial infection second one is gonorrhea third one is HIV syndrome fourth is syphilis and fifth is hepatitis so these are the studies you have to not, do the not, do notification and i'm going to be in detail <laughs> Okay. If there is any problem, please convey to me. So only few few more slides. So I know you are all. I mean, you want to prepare for your exams. So I have to complete the class as per the schedule. So bear me uh, for another five minutes. I'm going to complete the topic of STD today. Thank you.
Okay. So simply solarized colors used is a chronic viral infection caused by the spirochete. So here, yeah, two types of antibodies. One is antibodies cross and antibodies specific terminal. Hello. Hello. So, hello, there is a lot of disturbance. Hello. <laughs> Okay, I'm continuing the class because in between there is a lot of disturbance. I just uh, taken a pass. Okay. The mucocutaneous lesions of the both primary and secondary septics are teeming, uh, teeming with spirochetes and are highly infectious. Okay. So what is the primary and secondary syphilis patients are highly infectious. You have to remember this point. And syphilis is again common in HIV infected patients. So coming to the stage of syphilis, in primary syphilis, you will have a, a chancre, which is a painless lesion. All points are important. Hands and soles of feet is common in the secondary surplus. So, and one more important point I want to tell you is that regarding the pneumonia alba. So, in patients with congenital surplus. So, what happens is either they present as with late abortion or stillbirth, or in infant as a snuffles. I remember this point snuffles. Snuffles is nothing but a persistent rhinorrhea in, in infants. This is called as snuffles. Similar to those in the second disciplines in adults. In late or tardive congenital syphilis refers to cases of untreated congenital syphilis more than two years of duration. So, what is important here is the three important points one is subversion deformity caused by chronic inflammation of the periosteum of the tibia, and it's deformed monarchies is called mulberry mulberry. The chronic meningitis, chorioretitis, and gamma of nasal bone cartilage, all are important MCQs. You have to remember you have no option. On microscope, you'll find 
most specific lesions demonstrate proliferative endarthritis and a plasma cell rich inflammatory infiltrate. Gamma is occur most commonly in bone, skin, and mucous membranes of the upper airway, mouth, but, many, but any organ may be affected. Spirochetes are rarely demonstrable within the gammas. And gammas have a central area of necrosis surrounded by lymphoplasmatic infiltrates and epithelial cells. And the, the diagnostic mainstay is the serologic testing. The non reproducible antibody tests like BDRL and RPR are usually positive in early disease, but may be negative in advanced disease. Triponym specific antibody test results become positive later and remain positive indefinitely. And treponyms can also be identified by microscopic examination of primary and secondary lesions within the use of standard silver science. So this is how this start is time. Very, very important you have to remember this. So this is how it looks a primary syphilis case, the chancre. This is a, a painless lesion, which I mean, I mean ulcerated lesion, which will heal spontaneously. If you take a biopsy and see, you can see the, the plasma cell which infiltrate. So resulting in endothelitis and of course the, the fibrosis. Next important sexually transmitted disease is gonorrhea. This will this the you, you might have learned in detail in microbiology and sanskrit. And next is the non-gonorrhea is very, very important. So the, the organism responsible for non-gonorrhea. <laughs> And the painful which is caused by will also have inguinal implant and Then the granuloma inguinal caused by Organisms are visible at small cellular So Donovan which will be painful, the matters with and skin infection generally, along with regional enlargement. Recurrently, are more common with HSV1 than with the